Good morning, church family. It is great seeing you and, of course, wonderful hearing you sing praises to the Lord. Let me invite you to continue praising the Lord by taking your copy of the scriptures, if you have one handy, and turning with me to 2 Samuel. 2 Samuel. It's kind of early in the Old Testament. It won't take you long to find. We're going to be looking at chapters 11 and 12. Probably a fairly familiar story to you, the story of David and Bathsheba. We've been looking at the life of David. We started a month and a half ago, almost two months, and we are beginning to land the plane. Uh, next week, God willing, we'll look at how David died, and that'll be the end of the series on David. That <laughs> sounded kind of ominous. And David dies. But yes, we're going to be looking at uh, how his life how his life ended next next week. But today, we've got some business to take care of here in chapters 11 and 12 of 2 Samuel. I know you just sat down, but I'm going to invite you again to stand with me in honor of God's word. And I'm going to begin, even though we're going to be looking at verses in both chapters, I'm going to begin by looking at the final two verses of chapter 11. The final two verses of first of 2 Samuel chapter 11. <clears throat> when Uriah's wife heard that her husband Uriah had died, she mourned for him. When the time of mourning ended, David had her brought to his house. She became his wife and bore him a son. However, the Lord considered what David had done to be evil. Father, would you once again use this story Help us find ourselves in it, but more than that, help us see you in it and see you personally in our lives. We're not very different from David. We do countless things that you consider evil. May we reckon with that and know that our sins are many. God, may we sing from the top of our lungs that your mercy, however, is more. Teach us from your word, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. You can be seated. Whether you've grown up in church like myself or are fairly unfamiliar with the Bible, you've probably heard of two names associated with the Old Testament name David, and those names are Goliath and Bathsheba. Goliath, at the beginning of David's life, the shepherd boy who had much faith in God, overcame the giant and saw immediate success. God's hand was on him. It was wonderful. Dave rose to almost, Dave, David rose to almost immediate fame and popularity. Everybody's heard about David and Goliath. The little one takes down the big one. And probably you've heard of the woman Bathsheba, whereas Goliath represents David's success, Bathsheba represents David's downfall. Start of his life, everything looks wonderful, and everything as we've seen through our study of David, he's rocked along pretty good. And then we read chapter 11 and we think, oh my goodness. A man who's known after, a man after God's own heart also has a very wicked and selfish and evil heart. And in a weird way, it's kind of relieving to know that both can be true. Goliath, success, Bathsheba. Downfall. One commentator that I read this week commenting on the relationship between Goliath and Bathsheba wrote this. The physical forms attached to the names could hardly be more different. Goliath, an ugly, cruel giant. Bathsheba, a beautiful, gentle woman. Goliath, an evil tyrant. Bathsheba, an innocent victim. But different as Goliath and Bathsheba are in character, appearance, and spirit, there's a similarity in their relation to David. Both bring him into a field of testing, a place of encounter that reveals David's heart. We wish this story wasn't here. But it is. We need to deal with it. You know the story, most of you perhaps. The Bible tells us that when the kings went back to war, which was in the springtime, David decided to stay back this time. 
When he was a young shepherd boy, he was eager to run to the fight. Now he stays back because when we get to chapter 11, not only is David king, but David's been king for a while. He's now middle-aged, much older than I am. <laughs> David's not, it's not that funny. David, David's middle-aged, and he has seen massive success. If he told his field commanders, we're going to take this region, they took it, no problem. This region, they took it, no problem. He was popular. He was everyone's favorite king. He, Israel's hero, if you will. David had seen massive success. And now he was on easy street. And he was on such easy street, so powerful, so successful, he thought he'd just stay back while everybody else did the fighting. And so the Bible tells us why everybody else went to fight, David stayed back home. And one afternoon, when he woke up from his afternoon nap, he goes strolling and walking around on the roof. Now, I wouldn't advise you to do that because probably your roof is like this. But in Old Testament times, roofs were flat. They did a lot of what we call fellowshipping up there. Did a lot of different things on the roof. And David was out wandering on the roof, and he looked, and he saw a woman named Bathsheba who was bathing. David liked what he saw, and he found out who she was, whose wife she was, married woman, David's married, and he summons for someone to bring her to his chambers. Bathsheba spends the night, goes home the next morning. A week or so passes, and Bathsheba sends word to David, I'm pregnant. And the baby's yours. Adultery. The baby belongs to David. David's married to someone else. Bathsheba's married to Uriah. Well, David puts together a plan. We can't have a scandal like this in the nation of Israel. I mean, David's a godly man. So David puts together a plan. I know what I'll do. I'll send for her husband, Uriah, who's on the front lines, or fighting, I should say. And I'll bring him home, and I'll ask how things are going out there. And I'll, I'll say, that's why I'm bringing him home. But I know he'll stay a couple of days, and he'll go to his house and spend time with his wife. And then when, when he goes back to war, after they spend time together, everybody will think the baby's his. Problem solved. So he goes and he sends for Uriah, and he asks how the battle is, and then encourages Uriah to go to his house. Well, Uriah is a man of integrity, a man of character, a man of values, and he knows that he's got men out fighting, and he can't bear the thought of thinking he's going to go enjoy his family and his wife while his men are out fighting, so he sleeps overnight on David's porch. David wakes up the next morning and is like, what are you doing? You're supposed to go home, and he tells him, I can't do that. My men are all fighting. I have, I have to uphold my integrity and my values. Well, David goes to plan B. It's amazing what we do to try to cover up sin. Can't let this out. <laughs> so plan A doesn't work. He goes to plan B, and he says, I'll have Uriah stay the night. Well, he'll come over and watch the game, and I'll give him a lot of alcohol, a lot of alcohol, because if he has a lot of alcohol in him, maybe he won't be thinking right, and he'll go home. And if my plan works, he'll go home, spend the night, and everybody will think the baby belongs to him. Well, he does get him drunk, successful there, but even a drunken state could not, have, could not uh, compromise Uriah's values. He spends the night on the porch again. We got to go to plan C. So David comes up with plan C. Plan A didn't work, plan B didn't work. Why does Uriah have to be such a man of character? David writes a letter to the field commander, Joab, and he sends it through Uriah. Uriah didn't open it. You can't open a sealed king's letter unless you're the recipient. But Uriah had his death warrant in his hands because David pretty much said to Joab, I need you to make sure Uriah's on the front lines of battle, which means, in other words, make sure he's dead. Problem solved. It worked. Uriah's dead. Whew! Got that done. David gave 
Bathsheba a couple days to mourn, called him, called her to his house again. They got married. And everybody, all of Israel's full, thinking, isn't that sweet? It's horrible Uriah got, uh, got killed like that. That sure is awful. But isn't it nice that David's got another beautiful wife? And how sweet it is that they've got such a, such a sweet baby real quick after they got married. David committed adultery. <laughs> David murdered. Had Uriah killed. David lied. And if you're traditional Southern Baptist, the worst of all, you got someone drunk. <laughs> he did. And chapter 11 closes. The Lord considered what David had done to be evil. Now, I want to I wanna answer the question in just a minute. What does God do to people who commit such acts? What is God, how does God treat people who, who do things, who go through a season where the Lord considers what they did evil? Maybe you've never lived a season like that, but you know someone who does. How does God respond to someone like this? So I want to answer that question. But first I want to answer the question or, or look at how sin works. Because everything was going so good. <laughs> I mean, you read about David and you're like, man, what a guy. He and God were close, not just acquaintances, but tight, intimate, rich relationship. He worshiped God. He was loyal. He was a man of integrity and character. He didn't even try to kill Saul when he could have killed Saul, his enemy. There's so many incredible things that David is doing in, in the presence of the Lord, fully alive. And then he goes on a stroll on his roof, and the next thing you know, he's committed adultery, murdered, and lied to all of Israel. How? How does sin work? We get a clue in chapter 11. There's a word that is used 12 times in this one chapter. We pass over it because it's a short word and, and we use this word all the time. But in the Hebrew, in the original language, if we were to read chapter 11 in the original language, we would notice that there's this crazy word called shalach over and over and over again. I just really wanted to say that word like, that way. But that's the word used 12 times. And if we were to read this in the original Hebrew, we would note that. Wow, this is being used a lot. You say, well, what does the word mean? The word means sent. Sent, David sent for someone. Twelve times in chapter 11. Let me give you a couple of examples and I'll, I'll explain to you why I think this is important. Verse 1 of chapter 11. In the spring when kings march out to war, David sent Joab with his officers in all Israel. But David remained in Jerusalem. Verse 3, so David sent someone to inquire about her. And he said, well, I'll just stop there, uh, inquire about Bathsheba. Verse 4, David sent messengers to get her. Verse 6, David sent orders to Joab, send me Uriah the Hethite. Verse 14, the next morning David wrote a letter to Joab and sent it with Uriah. That's just a couple of examples. Twelve times in chapter 11. Sent, sent, sent. Why is that important? Because what do you do when you act this way? You're taking control. David had seen humans as ones that are actual human beings to have a relationship with. But now that he's high and mighty, successful, powerful, well, he's not treating humans as human beings. He's treating humans as objects. Go get me this. Go get me this. Go get me this. Go get me this. And the author of 2 Samuel 11 is using this word over and over and over again to tell us that David is trying to take control of the circumstances. And if you and I are very honest with ourselves, that's exactly what we do when we sin. We don't like the way God's doing things. We don't like the way he's laid things out for us. So we say, I'll handle it. I don't like these circumstances. I'll do it my way. I don't like that you say don't do this. I want to do it because I know better than you, God. I don't like that you say do this. I don't want to do that. I'm going to do this my way. Sin sees people as objects that we can control instead of beings that you're in relationship with. 
And over and over in chapter 11, we see this man who was once letting God control him for a season says, I don't like the way things are. I'm in charge, God. And I have a pretty good feeling if you survey your sin patterns, you'll notice a very similar thing. I'm going to do it the way I want to. And sin never delivers on its promise, does it? We try to take control, and man, do we mess it up. Philosopher, theologian, author Dallas Willard said this. He said, this is the basic idea behind all temptation. God is presented as depriving us by his commands of what is good. As a result, we think we must take matters into our own hands and act contrary to what he said. This image of God leads to our pushing him out of our thoughts and placing ourselves on the throne. It's exactly what David did. It's exactly what we do. It's what Adam and Eve did in the garden. I know God said don't do this, but we want to be like God, and it messed everything up, and we've been doing the same thing ever since. God Thanks, I've got it from here. And it never works out well. Sin tries to ignore God. Sin tries to forget God. Sin tries to tell God, I don't like this. I've got it now. I can handle this. And before we know it, we found ourselves in a pretty big mess. (laughs) Everything was going so good, David. And now you done up and did this. So, how does God treat people who act this way? How does God act towards people who displease him? Even people who know better, like David. David wasn't ignorant. He knew what he was doing. How does God treat people that can be so full of worship? And then the next minute, so full of, oh my gosh. Let's look at it. I think it's what the first half of chapter 12 is about. What was that word that was used 12 times? The English word that was used 12 times in chapter 11? Thank you. There's a play on words in verse 1 of chapter 12. Watch this. Chapter 11 ends with the Bible say, or us being told that what David did was considered evil. So that's how it's done. So, what, so David tries to control everything in chapter 11. Look in verse 1 of chapter 12. So the Lord sent Nathan to David. It's a beautiful play on words. It's, it's the author's way of saying God was communicated to Nathan, I'm in charge. I'm do the sending. I'm in control. The Lord does the sending. We think we've got control. Most scholars, get this, most scholars believe, or I say a lot, believe that about a year took place between the end of chapter 11 and the beginning of chapter 12. Which means probably David thought, whew, got that done. Nobody knows. Bathsheba knows. I know. Maybe Joab knows a little bit. But 99% of Israel has no clue. Whew, got that done. And then out of nowhere, the Lord sent Nathan to David. Uh Uh-oh. You know one of the first things God does to us? To those that he loves who commit sin against him, he lets us know that he knows what we've done. God loves us too much not for him to let us know what we've, that he knows what we've done. God sends uh, no, David a preacher. The preacher's name was Nathan, and man was this guy a master storyteller. I long to be able to preach like this because by the time he was done with his little message, he had David in the palm of his hands. I try this every week, but y'all just keep jumping out. 
Nathan, Nathan preached this little, this little story to David. I don't know if they were sitting by the fire. I, I don't know. But God sent Nathan to David and gave Nathan a story. David thought that this was actually happening under his rule, under his kingdom. And here's the story in brief. God said, or Nathan says to David, hey, Nathan, uh, uh, David, there were two, two men. One was incredibly wealthy and prosperous, had everything, had flocks, had herds, had it all. There was another man uh, nearby who had nothing, incredibly poor, poverty-stricken, he and his family. Well, they scraped and they saved, and the very poor man finally got enough to buy a lamb for his family. They loved this lamb. They treated this lamb like family. It was, it was part of their lives. Well, one day, the rich man had a visitor stop by, and the visitor stayed for dinner. And the rich man thought, I don't want to take a lamb from my fold. I'll take a lamb from this poor man's fold. And so he took the lamb, slaughtered it, cooked it, and the rich man and his visitor ate the poor man's lamb for dinner. The Bible tells us that David stopped and said, that man must be killed. That man deserves to die. You mean to tell me that somebody had everything and they took the one thing that didn't belong to them because they thought they needed it? <laughs> Who would do that? You got to wonder if Nathan was like, I don't know. I don't know if Nathan gave him the stink eye. I don't know if Nathan just stood there like, but he had him right where he wanted him. That man deserves to die. He had everything, and yet he's going to take this one thing that doesn't belong to him. How could that happen? And what does Nathan say to him? Put your eyes on verse 7. Nathan replied to David, you are the man. It's you, David. You're him. You have acted this way. By the way, church, notice the gospel, the Bible, truth, it's very personal. Preaching should be very personal. It's not for somebody else. It's for you. It's God saying to you. Nathan says, you are this guy. In other words, God is letting you know that he knows what's happened. You think it's over. Oh, no, God knows. And it's you. You do know, don't you, that it's very loving for God to tell us that he knows what we've done. It doesn't feel loving, <laughs> but it is. It's incredibly loving for God to let you know that he knows that you're a part of something destructive. Just imagine with me that one of my three kids was involved in illegal drugs, and I knew about it, but I said nothing. How loving would that be? You come up to me and you say, hey, such and such is doing some illegal drugs. I thought you should know. And I say, oh, I know. I'm just not going to talk about it with them. Boy, that'd be a blessing to them. No, the loving thing is to say, I know what you're doing and it will destroy you. That's loving. It is loving for God to say, I know what you did. And there are going to be major consequences, David, which leads us to the second thing God does. Not only does, does, does God love us enough to tell us that he knows, but God loves us enough to give us consequences for our actions. You do know, don't you, that when you sin, there are consequences. And this is actually, even though it doesn't feel it, it's actually a very loving thing. Can you imagine what a cesspool we would be in if there were no consequences for sins? <laughs> okay, I think we'd be in some. It'd be bad. God reminds us by every time there are consequences with our sins, and there are always consequences with our sins, God reminds us that we weren't wired to disobey. We weren't wired to live in sin. God loves us, and if we step outside of that love and do things our own way, there must be consequences because it's not how he made us to live. And the second, second thing God uses Nathan to do to David is to say, you need to let him know that there will be major consequences because of his sin. Put your eyes on verse 10 of chapter 12. I think it's verse 10. Yes, verse 10. Nathan to David, now therefore the sword will never leave your house. 
because you despised me and took the wife of Uriah the Hethite to be your own wife. This is what the Lord says. I'm going to bring disaster on you from your own family. I will take your wives and give them to another before your very eyes, and he will sleep with them in broad daylight. You acted in secret, but I will do this before all Israel and in broad daylight. In short, David, you have messed up your entire family. For the rest of your life, your family's a mess. And if you keep reading, you think you're watching the Jerry Springer episode. It's bad. His sins were passed on to his sons, sins of power and sexual escapades. And Nathan is letting David know, God knows what you've done and there will be consequences for your sins. Your family will suffer as a result of what you've done. Goes on to say, the baby that Bathsheba was pregnant with out of wedlock, that baby will die. There are consequences to your actions, David. David will have to live with that. And you and I need to be reminded and hopefully have some holy fear injected in our soul that there are consequences for sinful actions. Let that land on you because it's true. Which brings me now to this. What about God's relationship with David? What about David's relationship with God? Everything was so beautiful, so intimate, so sweet, so rich. David and God, God and David together. And now David's gone off and done these things, and, and there's a separation between he and God. What does God do to, to those who love him, who commit such acts? How does God respond? We know there's consequences. We know God knows our sins. But what about this? What about the relationship between us and God? How can, how can things be okay between us again? Sin and consequences, that we've been seeing it <coughs> Excuse me, since Adam and Eve. It's so boring. It's so lifeless. It's so we can predict this stuff. But I mean, you know what's beautiful? Redemption, salvation, every one of our stories, there's a different beauty and different picture of salvation. And the same is here. There's a beautiful conversation between Nathan and David in verses 13 and 14. Actually, it's between, uh, between God and David through the prophet Nathan. I want you to put your eyes on verse 13. And let's look at what God does uh, to, to restore our relationship with him. Verse 13, uh, 2 Samuel 12. David responded to Nathan. I have sinned against the Lord. Then Nathan responded, replied to David, and the Lord has taken away your sin. You will not die. However, because you treated the Lord with such content in this matter, the son born to you will die. I don't know if you mark in your Bible, but one of the beautiful phrases in this passage is David saying, I have sinned against God. The Lord. He owns it. He doesn't say, you weren't there. She egged me on. It's her fault. Uriah was a jerk. He got what was treated, what was what was coming to him. I was lonely. What was I supposed to do? I've got needs. I'm king. <laughs> it's what kings do, Nathan. That's not what he does. I, very personal, have sinned against the Lord. Now, Wes Franklin, I may be overspeaking this, but you don't feel safe enough to make a statement like that unless you know the Lord you're talking about. I have sinned against Yahweh. He is holy. He is just. He is righteous. But he is merciful and loving and gracious and forgiving. We aren't humble enough to own it unless we feel safe enough to own it in the presence of this God. And he owns it. 
He doesn't blame anybody. He says, I have sinned against the Lord. <laughs> now, now watch what Nathan says next. You'd think Nathan would be like, got that right. It's over between you and God. I wonder what you think sometimes after you wake up after a season of sin, what God is saying to you. What Nathan does next is shocking. Again, verse 13. Then Nathan replied to David, and the Lord has taken away your sin. You will not die. <laughs> Did y'all just see what I read? What? Oh, is that how you do things, God? Adultery, murder, lies, and you're just going to sweep it under the rug. Oh, the Lord has taken away your sin. Have a great day, David. What? Where's the justice? Can you imagine if you're Bathsheba's parents? Do you know what he did to my, to my daughter? And you're just going to say, sins are gone. <laughs> you're not going to die. You deserve death, but you're not going to die. Your sins are gone, David. Or can you imagine if you're Uriah's parents? This man had my son murdered, and God's just going to say, your sins are gone. That doesn't make sense to me. Where's the justice? Somebody's got to pay. Somebody's got to pay for his sins. I want you to read verse 14 with me. And if you know your gospel, the gospel, I want you to tell me if this sounds familiar to you. Verse 14. However, because you treated the Lord with such content in this matter, the son born to you, Will die. David, you're not going to die. An innocent son is going to die. David, you deserve to die. But a son is going to die instead. David, a consequence of your sin is your son dying instead of you. But that is going to be a, a picture, a type of something much deeper, much greater, much more global. Because David, I'm going to send my son who will die for the sins of the world. God has taken away your sin, David. God has taken away your sin, ma'am. God has taken away your sin, sir. You say, well, what about? Because somebody died in your place. And it's a son, an innocent son named Jesus. There's our word again. God sent his son to be the savior of the world. What do you do? Own it. Own your sin. I have sinned against the Lord. And what's he going to do? He's going to say there's consequences. But you and I, I did what I had to to come to you. Don't go to God and say, I promise I'm going to do better tomorrow. I'm going to do better next week. I'm not going to do that again. That won't get you very far. How well, how's it worked for you before? Go to God's character and depend on what he is going to do for you. Most scholars, most everybody believes that David wrote Psalm 51 after this event. A lot of people believe he wrote Psalm 32 as well. I mean, this event deserves two psalms, I think. So that's, that sounds okay to me. But most everybody believes he wrote Psalm 51. I encourage you to marinate in Psalm 51 and think this is what David penned and prayed to the Lord after what he did with Bathsheba and Uriah. But I'm going to read the first verse to you, and I want you to watch this. Just watch this. Verse 1 of Psalm 51. Be gracious to me, God, according to the promises I made to you never to do it again. Is that what it says? This is the audience participation portion of our program. Is that what it says? No. Be gracious to me, God, because I messed up, but I'm going to do better next time. Now, what does he say? Be gracious to me, God, according to your faithful love, according to your abundant compassion, blot out my rebellion. 
David says, I'm going to write a book, and the book is not How I Overcame Sin. We don't read that ever. He says, I'm going to write a book, and it's going to be about what God did to get me back. And God's grace and power in my life. What do you do? Confess. Go to God and trust on the character of God to restore that relationship with you. Aren't you glad God does the sending?